I shared a story with the folks backstage and they thought it was funny. I said, well, I've told that to the church. And they said, no, you haven't. And so I'm depending upon your fading memories <laughs> to keep my story supply fresh. So a member of our church invited me to go deer hunting, which surprised me because I'm not much of a hunter. I was even more surprised when both he and I shot at the same time and down went the deer. We got into an argument as to who shot the deer. I said, I shot it. He said, no, I shot it. I said, I shot it. He said, no, I shot it. I guess it was such a brouhaha. It caused quite a stir because here comes the gay warden. He said, what are you guys arguing about? And we told him, he said, well, I can solve this. And he walked over and he looked at the animal and then he looked back at us and he said, any chance one of you is a preacher? <laughs> I raised my hand. I said, I am. He said, you shot the deer. I said, how do you know? He said, because the bullet went in one ear out the other. You hadn't heard that. <laughs> you just forgot. <laughs> Whether you're watching online or at one of our campuses, we're very grateful that you're a part of this special study of the promises of God. There's over 7,000 promises made by God to his people. He's a promise maker. He's a promise keeper. We're only looking at a handful in the hope that it will cultivate a desire within each one of us to deeply appreciate the promises of God and to build our lives, not upon the circumstances of life, but the promises of God. Each week we make a declaration, we put our shoulders back, we sit up straight, we wake up our husbands, <laughs> we breathe in a bunch of hope, and we fill our hearts with the promise of God. Can we say it out loud together? Let's say it really strong today because it's cold outside. Let's warm up the room, shall we? We are building our lives on the promises of God because his word. We do not stand or on them. We stand. Amen. Amen. Bless you, Father. Bless you that you have given us a place to stand. Bless you, Father. Have mercy upon our speaker. His sins are way too many to count. And grant that we might see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, a wealthy Texas rancher passed away and friends and relatives from all over the country came for the reading of the will in the hope that they would be uh, a recipient of some of his fortune. And so the lawyer gathered all the people together and uh, he began to read the words of the rancher. Uh, to my wife, Judy, I'll leave the ranch. Uh, to my good friend, Homer, uh, I'll leave my oil stocks. Uh, to my best buddy, Joseph, I'll leave my Colorado condominiums. Uh, to my uh, son, John, I'll leave all my jets. And to my cousin, Willie, who always asked if he could be remembered in my will. Hello, Willie. <laughs> well, maybe you feel like Willie. Maybe you feel like your requests haven't been heard. Maybe you feel like you're overlooked and neglected. If so, boy, do I have a promise for you. It's really one of the great promises that we study. It's found in the book of Romans chapter eight, which in and of itself is a wonderful chapter in the Bible. But the promise reads like this, in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Can we read that promise out loud? In all things God works for the good of those who love him. How many of you would benefit from that promise today? Maybe you're wondering if the money's going to come in, if the tests are going to turn out right. Maybe you're wondering if you're going to be remembered or considered. Maybe you're wondering if you're going to survive this round of layoffs. Or maybe you're wondering if the divorce is really going to be stopped. Maybe you're wondering if you have reason to be hopeful, reason to be optimistic, because many times you feel like you're nothing more than a cork bobbing in a sea of uncertainty, and you do not know where life 
is going to take you or if anyone is in charge of history. In moments like that, we turn to promises like this. We believe that in all things, God works. And not only does he work, he works for the good. He works for the good of those who love him. I think the whole Bible is a demonstration of this promise, but I believe that one of the great condensed stories that illustrate this promise is found in the Old Testament, a fascinating story entitled The Book of Esther. Let's see if we can cover the whole story in one lesson. You probably are acquainted with this story. If you're not, I've divided it up into three sections. The history of the story begins in the fifth century BC in the nation of Persia, 127 provinces comprised the nation of Persia. The Southern Kingdom of Judah had migrated into the Persian Empire some, hundred, some 70 years, oh, I'm sorry, some hundred years back. After 70 years, they were given permission to return to Israel and about 50,000 of them did, but many of them stayed and integrated into the Persian Empire. One of the Persian leaders was unhappy that they did. So let's start with him. Let's start with the evil plot of Haman. The evil plot of Haman. He was an influential member of the king's court. The king's name was Xerxes. I know, isn't that great? Name your son Xerxes. What don't you? It's got two X's in it. X-E-R-X-E-S. Xerxes. Had it not been for one particular Jew by the name of Mordecai, there would have been disaster. By the way, you already know three of the four main characters in the book. You want to say them? Haman, Xerxes, I love saying that, Xerxes, and Mordecai. Don't be mortified by Mordecai. It's just a name. <laughs> so Haman can be, I'm sorry, I just thought of that. So Haman convinced King Xerxes that the nation would be better off with no Jews. This is atrocious, I know. But he convinced the king to exterminate all of the Jews. King Xerxes agreed and he signed the order by pressing his signet ring into a wax seal, which made it an irreversible order. All that was left was to set the date for the extermination. Well, of all things, Haman rolled the dice. He literally rolled the dice and landed on a date that was 11 months in the future, in a month that on their calendar was called Adar, A-D-A-R, Adar the 13th. I guess Friday the 13th, but Adar the 13th. It correlates with uh, February and March on our calendars today. So the date was set. Hamar was happy. Everything was turning up great for him. He was rolling the dice and rolling nothing but sevens. Israel got the short straw and the dice did not seem to fall in Israel's favor. Yet there was another storyline developing of which Haman and Xerxes knew nothing about. And this storyline was a storyline that would interrupt the evil plot of Haman. Let's look at scene number two and that is the provision of a queen. The provision of a queen. So Xerxes threw this seven day long party in which he wanted to show off his power, in which he wanted to show off his wealth, which he wanted to show off his wife. His wife was Queen Vashti. At a certain point in the party when everybody was several days drunk, he called for Vashti to come in dressed in her royal robe and she refused. She refused. Maybe she was playing bunko. Maybe she was not in a good mood. Most likely she did not like being paraded around like a horse at the county fair. So she refused. Well, King Xerxes was not accustomed to having his requests go unmet. So he assembled his council. He didn't know what to do. Here was the report of the council. 
Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will be known to all the women, and they will despise their husbands and say, queen, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. I have a hunch that report wouldn't go over well today. <laughs> so from this council, the king put forth a formal decree that Queen Vashti would be stripped of her power, have her I'm sorry, crown removed, and she should no long, could no longer see King Xerxes, which I have a hunch pleased her. <laughs> so the country was in need of a new queen, and they staged the ancient equivalent of a bachelor show. And King Xerxes was given opportunities to spend evenings with the most beautiful women in the kingdom. And the one who won the contest was none other than young Esther. There you go, Esther. You knew she would show up, right? Well, it turns out that Esther does not disclose her nationality. She was a Hebrew girl. Turns out that she was the niece of, anyone want to guess? Mordecai. Yes, Mordecai, the very one Haman was out to kill. So look what's happening. God, who loves the Hebrew people, because through the Hebrew people, he's going to bring the Messiah, is orchestrating a plan whereby he places a Hebrew girl in the throne room of the Persian Mordecai urges Esther to step up and speak up. By now we're nine months away from Adar 13. Remember what's gonna happen on Adar 13? The extermination of the Jewish people. The king had promised the Persian people that they could destroy any Hebrew they knew and collect all their possessions. So the Hebrews were nervous, the Persians were excited, Mordecai came up with a plan, but Esther was reluctant. And she reminded her uncle Mordecai, hey, even though I'm the queen, I don't have the privilege to just saunter into the throne room unsummoned. I could lose my life. Well, Mordecai urges her to do so. And he does so with words that had become so famous they could qualify as a part of a Hollywood script. Do not think that because you are the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. What insight from Mordecai. He says, we're going to be delivered. God's people will be preserved. The question is not, will God win? The question is, will you be a part of the victory? This is really the same promise that applies to us. The assurance of God's victory is sure. I know as we look around, we feel like there are Adar 13s happening all over the globe. And maybe you feel like you have Haman's evil people in your life or King Xerxes irresponsible leaders in your life and you wonder where this world is headed. But the promise of God and the promise of the Bible is God will win the day. God will have his way. There will be a time in which God will resurrect his people into a new world and he will redeem them and he will press the resurrection power button on the whole universe and we will enjoy this life as it was intended to be enjoyed always in the presence of God. No more malice, no more greed, no more chauvinistic attitudes. We will be in the presence of God. We will enjoy the new kingdom. That day will happen. The only question that remains is, are we a part of the victory? The promise of God is in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So Esther made her choice. She said, I will go to the king even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I 
perish. The final scene, the queen throws a party. Three days later, Esther entered the throne room without being summoned. I guess King Xerxes was in a good mood because when he saw the young queen come into the room, he said, oh, I'm so happy to see you. Whatever you want, up to half of my kingdom, I will give you. Well, she knew exactly what she wanted. And she told the king that she would like a dinner party. A small dinner party in, in, in involving three people. The king, the queen, and does anybody know? Haman. Hmm. Why Haman? Why the villain? Why the culprit? Well, you're about to see. Haman gets the invitation. And boy, does that put a swagger in his step. Not only is he one of the king's trusted men, not only is he getting his way with setting up this massive holocaust, no, 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 not only is he having everything turn out right, now he has been invited to a special private dinner in the Oval Office. Things are going so well for him that he thinks it's time for me to take care of that one fly in my ointment by the name of Mordecai. And so he erects a 75 foot pole and he plans the next morning to ask King Xerxes if King Xerxes would mind if he impaled, it's a terrible story, if he impaled Mordecai on the pole. Well, that night something happens. King Xerxes cannot sleep. He has no sheep to count. He has no NyQuil to take. And so he calls for someone in his court to fetch him a book, I guess in the hopes that that book would put him to sleep. And the book was an account of all the day-to-day -day events in the court of King Xerxes. It just so happened that whoever read the book opened the book to the page that recounted the day in which Mordecai got wind of an assassination plot in the court and put an end to it by eliminating two men who were going to assassinate Xerxes. Well, Xerxes thought to himself, we need to do something special for Mordecai. And he asked the court uh, appointed reader, have we ever done anything special for Mordecai to thank him for this? And they said, no. Well, the next morning, Haman comes into the king's court. And the king has a question for Haman. Before Haman can make his request about Mordecai, the king has a question. Does anybody remember what this question is? He says to Haman, supposing there was a man who saved my life, who protected me from an assassination plot, and he's great and he's wonderful, how would we honor such a man? Well, Haman, ever the narcissist, thinks that the king is talking about him. And he says, well, I know what I would do. I'd put a royal robe on that guy and I'd give him a parade. <laughs> and so the king looked at Haman and said, go do that for Mordecai. <laughs> well, you talk about mortified. <laughs> Haman was. And so rather than kill Mordecai, he has to stage a celebration for Mordecai and he has to drive the king's stretched limo through the city with Mordecai in the back seat. The parade lasts all day. Haman barely has time to change clothes before he goes to the Oval Office for the dinner. After the dinner, the king asks Esther if she has any request. The moment of truth. Esther reveals her identity and she says, not only am I of Hebrew heritage, but there is a plan afoot to destroy all of my kinsmen. And the king, somehow not knowing this was happening, I have to think it was denial, but somehow acted like he did not know this was happening. And he said, who would be in charge of such an evil plot? Well, if you listen quietly to the Bible, you hear a big gulp from Haman because she turns 
and she puts her finger right on his beady nose and says, him. Well, the king is so upset. He gets up and he walks out of the room. Haman is so afraid, he begins to plead for mercy from Esther. And we're not given the details, but in some accident, he trips and he falls. And when Xerxes comes back in, it looks like Haman is putting the move on the queen. It's all over for Haman. He ends up impaled on the pole he had erected for Mordecai. And to put salt in the wound, Mordecai is promoted to Haman's position and given all of Haman's possessions. And so the first order of business for Mordecai is to take care of this Adar 13 problem. Well, he cannot revoke the edict, but he can add one. And he asks King Xerxes to give the Hebrew people permission to fight back. And King Xerxes does so. So in Adar 13, when the Persians turn to attack their neighbors and destroy them and take their possessions, they are unaware that the Hebrews have been training and they're ready. In three days, the war rages, but the Hebrews win. 75,000 Persians are killed and the Hebrew nation is saved. To this day, the Hebrew people celebrate that with what is called, anybody want to guess? The Feast of Purim. Remember the word for dice is pur. Did I mention that? P-U-R. The Feast of Purim celebrates the day that the Hebrew people were delivered. I wonder how that story might impact your life today. I wonder how that story might speak to the concerns and the questions that you brought into this room. I wonder if you are awakened today with anxieties or if you're having trouble sleeping at night because of the uncertain future of your life. I wonder if you need to be reminded of the promise that's found in the book of Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33 that says, we may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. The great promise of scripture is that we have a good God and this good God is up to something good. And in all things, in all things, even the evil plots of Haman's, even the irresponsible leadership of King Xerxes, in all things, God is at work. So do not lose hope, do not give up. Do not assume that the story that you're being a part of is the only story that's being written. Listen to me. There is another storyline. There is another storyline. And that storyline is being written by the Almighty God. And that storyline declares in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It's interesting the way the Apostle Paul wrote this verse. He didn't say in each thing there is good. No one would say it was good what Haman did. No one would say it was good what Xerxes did. But the Apostle Paul, I think, is telling us that when all of these things come together, God uses them to create the higher good. We see an example of this every day, those of us who drink a cup of coffee. Maybe you do what I do. First thing in the morning, I make a cup of coffee in my favorite anxious for nothing mug. Not really, it just happens to say anxious for nothing. I drink, I take a cup of coffee and I take a sip. And I say, now that is good. That is good. Do you ever do that? When you say that is good, what are you saying? Are you saying that the coffee grounds by themselves are good? Do you ever just take a spoonful of coffee grounds? Even if it's Maxwell House coffee? You're not saying that the, that the coffee grounds are good. You're not saying that the coffee filter is good. You're not saying that the container in which the coffee is brewed is good. You're not saying even that the hot water or the hot water dispenser is good. What you are saying is that if you take all of these elements 
and you combine them at the right temperature with the right recipe under the oversight of somebody who knows how to make coffee, then something good is going to happen. It is, it is really essential that you hear this promise. There are things in life that are not good. They're not. They are things that are a consequence of the fall. Divorce is not good. Cancer is not good. Angry outbursts are not good. The abusive father, that's not good. But God's promise to you is that he can take all of those things, all of those things, and if we will continue to love him, if we will wait on him, and we trust in him, and we lean into him, he can take those and he can mix them together. And he can create a story of deliverance, just like he did in the life of Esther, just like he did in the Old Testament story of Joseph, just like he did in the Old Testament story of David, but most of all, just like he did in the story of Jesus Christ. There's nothing good about a cross. There's nothing good about betrayal. There's nothing good about a savior being slain, a savior being slain. There's nothing good about being buried in a borrowed tomb. But in the hands of the almighty God, he can take that which was intended for evil and he can turn it into the greatest event in the history of the world. This is the Christian hope. This is God's promise that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Amen. Grant us, Father God, hearts of hope hearts of hope. It's so easy to be people of despair. Please help us to be people of hope. And I'm praying especially, Father, right now for those who need this message deeply, who barely made it into the church service today because they're so discouraged and they're carrying grief that weighs them down or anxiety that keeps them up. We beg you, Father, to do a work, a miracle work a miracle in their lives. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said,